Yes, I'm so excited. I'm bubbling, bubbling. I'm excited. I'm, I'm humbled. Um, I'm so filled with love, and I'm excited that we are finally kicking off season one of Herb Motivates. You know what's crazy is we're going to look back on this and be like, wow, from our humble, beautiful beginnings here at what I call the camp. We are in Camp Springs, Maryland, the DMV. As you can see, I'm representing for those bisons, even though I went to the OC. Don't get it twisted. I'm still an Oakwoodite. But tonight, tonight, I mean today, I mean whatever you're watching this, because this is going to be something that's going to be recorded. This is something that you're going to want to um, play and get motivated and inspired. Um, this one is going to go down in history, because this is our first, and there's nothing better than the first. Sade said, it's always, it's never as good as the first time. So, without further ado, I want to introduce to some uh, and uh, present to many um, someone who comes to us, whose family, who I've known for at least a couple decades. Like I said, a couple days, I mean a couple decades, let me not be afraid to say it. Um, a friend, uh, a father, a brother, motivational speaker, uh, Iron Man, superhero, uh, international recording artist. Um, without further ado, thank you for coming and being with us, Mr. V. Joel, Joey Kibble. Man, <laughs> with an intro like that, <laughs> we... We don't need the rest of the show. You just, All right, we need to just let's get, you stop just pretty much <laughs> ended it right there. Hey man, what's up, man? I'm really, really, really happy that you're with us. Um, I'm still pumped up, man. We okay. just came off of a, uh, I say tour. I want it to be a tour. It's about to be a tour. Right. But we just had this conference. Uh, let's start off there. Right. Uh, could you tell the people the conference, uh, sustain the chain conference? And uh, tell us a little bit about that. Sustain the chain. That is, people are trying to make changes in their lives. But once you get off of that highway that you're on, get off the ramp and get onto that road to change, what happens now? And we had, what was it, six speakers, yes. five presenters, yes. five or six? Yes. And we all came from different areas, financial, educational, uh, legal, um, you know, personal, and we share tools on how to sustain the change. Man, I and was, was, I was motivated oh, by man. it. Yeah, I'm still there. You see, uh, I'm still wearing a band. Didn't you kick From it off? September you kicked it off, man. I did kick it off, man. man you but were on fire. Wait a minute. I was the alpha and you were the omega because yeah. you ended it. <laughs> I did. I did end it. <laughs> so we're going to get to some more of that as we start. Uh -huh. Well, I want to really get into it and then start talking. As a member of the internationally acclaimed group take six mm -hmm. we got a lot to talk about we got a lot of ground to cover right. so i like to get into it right. so i met you um in 1989 as, as freshmen at uh freshmen at oakwood college in huntsville mm -hmm. huntsville right. alabama don't make me no never mind never did never <laughs> will man it was crazy going to oakwood because right. it's all black school and we're in huntsville yeah. and i was kind of scared at first but Meeting some really phenomenal brothers like yourself, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was amazing. At that time, Take Six had already, uh, I believe in 88, they actually won their first Grammy? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? No, it actually started in 88, um, recording. The interesting way that they got started was they did a showcase in Nashville, Tennessee. It was a group called Alliance. They were first called Alliance another group called Special Blend, a Special Blend. And actually, a Special Blend was vetted to get the recording contract, and Take Six Alliance was opening for a Special Blend. Wow. Okay. They invited all of the gospel labels, all of the Christian labels. None of them showed up. None of them came out. Uh, but uninvited, other labels, heads of labels came. And one of those uh, was Jim Ed Norman, and he was over uh, Warner Brothers in Nashville. Wow. He came uninvited, um, and they both did their thing. And he was like, 
I like that group, Alliance. I don't know what to do with them. Wow. But let's talk. Let's find something. Eventually, that uh, became them signing with Warner Brothers at the time. Somebody else had the trademarks and the name Alliance. And so they went with the democratic process and picked Take Six. Now, so you say they very clearly because at that time, you probably had just graduated from, I believe, Pine Forge Academy. Is that correct? Pine Forge Academy. And you're on your way now to Oakwood Oakwood. College. Yes. And you're starting off with myself, and, and, and that would be the summer or fall of 1989. Right. Right. And... We were all at Cunningham Hall. Mm. It was not co-ed at all. Mm. It was a boys dorm. Still isn't. And (laughs) 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 more things change, the more they remain the same. (laughs) Um, And so people knew like you were that dude on campus, right? I mean, just saying. Because you were Mark Kibble's little brother. So, and it wasn't like you weren't a singer yourself, right? I mean, you were singing. And you have the talent then. It wasn't like... I had my own groups. Um, I had a couple of groups. I had a group uh, when I was at Oakwood Academy. And then that was the first two years. And then the last two years, I went to Pine Forge Academy. Gotcha. I had a group then. Uh, now, interestingly, um, people don't know that when Alliance was really getting ready to go um, professional, that three of the members left then. Um, three of the original members left and my brother tried to get me into the group then oh wow I was in high school though and my parents were like no go absolutely not right because this is the music industry right you're gonna fall on your face you need to have an education you ain't getting out of school to do such and such so well that's why you should say that though because you, you you you, you go to Oakwood, yeah. not to interrupt you here, but you, I don't even know if you had finished the first semester. Yeah. How um, did that work? Well, so again, this is before I went to Oakwood. Okay. Um, and my parents were like, nah, he's in high school. You're right. not doing that. Right. So this was the second time that Mervyn Warren left the group in 1991. And Mark was like, you know what? We're considering, you know, having you um, replace Merv, you know, sit for for a second, see how you feel about it, pray about it, and then let us know. And I mean, I'm just, my head is blown. So for the first seven years of being in Take Six, I, of course, self-doubting and all that kind of stuff was like, why did they ask me? You had Brian McKnight that had, they were considering, you had Chris Willis. And I couldn't even be named in those guys. You had Russell Thomas, who's Dave's brother. They were considering all of them. And I was like, oh, man, I don't don't know why they would even think of me because they're just like liquid talent. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. But apparently there was a reason why it was for me to be in the group. Right. But it took me a good seven years to really become comfortable wow. in my skin wow. Wow. because I didn't know why I was, I had been picked. And I think people. that, you know, that, that, that's something that I, you know, I'm trying to develop people to understand that there's mm. something divine in you. Mm. Think about wow. that. Think. Something divine in you. <laughs> Somebody, give better, it to us, man. somebody better give him the quote. <laughs> no, <laughs> give I don't need to give it to you. You gave it to him just fine. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to give it again. <laughs> I found a gold mine. That's I mean, it. listen, it was crazy. So let me just tell you a little bit about my side. Mm. Like every Friday to hear Take Six, the dudes used to play y'all. I mean, mm. I mean, you heard it from different parts of the hall every Friday night. Mm. Different mm. people are playing that gold mine, that, wow. that Take Six album. And I mean, it was incredible. Wow. I, I want to talk to you about so how did you feel now? You that first seven years, you're doing a whole lot of stuff. You're traveling the world now. Mm-hmm. You're meeting people like Stevie Wonder, Quincy Jones. Tell me more about that, because I wasn't there. I'm just on the outside looking in. You know, who, well, what, tell us some of the amazing people that you met, worked with, or mentored by. 
and had the, uh, the, the privilege of maybe even collaborating with? Well, um, one of the reasons why I was so excited about it is because now I'll finally have the chance to meet everybody that I've always looked up to because wow. Take Six is now crossing paths with all these inspirational pe people you grew up listening to their music. Right. Um, I, I went through a period of trying to adjust. Um, I was trying to come back to Oakwood because that was my second year, the middle of my second year gotcha. that I left this time. Okay. And so I was leaving school. There was a lot of uh, apprehension. My parents weren't with it. They were oh, like, wow. you're going you to fall on your face. And what ended up happening was my father talked to our music teacher at the time. And he asked him, do you think he should get into this group? And the music teacher at that time, uh, Dr. Anthony, mm -hmm. I think his name was Anthony. Mm -hmm. He said, let him join a group. There are things in, that I could never teach him. Mm. in books wow. that he will now experience wow. because he's going to these cultures. Right. He's going to these different tongues, these different languages. I'll never be able to teach him that. Wow. Let him experience that. Amazing. Experience and is that's, a hard teacher. Mm. Right, right, right. To and that's first. actually what tipped the scales for my dad. Wow. That's why my dad let his hands off. was like, okay, well just just do your, do your thing. So now on the flip side of that, you're meeting going to the Grammys and you're meeting, who are some of the people? Because I, I know some of them. I mean, uh, Quincy there Jones. There are a lot of Quincy Jones, Whitney Houston, Stevie Wonder, Ray Charles. You know, I, uh, one thing I know about Joey is this. He, he's a very humble dude and he's not the type of guy that likes to, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I, I know that about <laughs> you. But, for the purposes of no, this, no, because we're trying to really motivate people right. and let them know you can, not that you were in the gutter, mm -hmm. not that you were in the streets and homeless, mm -hmm. but you were a regular guy with some talent, mm -hmm. and how God could take somebody from nowhere and then put them on the pedestal before all the world. You sang before four sitting presidents. I mean, this is not, you know, Margaret Mead says, you know, there's no reason for you to play small, right? Mm -hmm. And you didn't know I was going to coach you on the show. See, look like at that. that. But it's Irv Motivates. That's Come correct. On. No, but seriously. Irv coaches. Because, because I feel and I see, you know, God is using you now mm -hmm. in a way I've never seen before, right? I, I mean, you are right now triathlon man, Iron Man. Tell us about that, you know, a little bit more. But I want it for people that don't know, mm -hmm. right? They might be able to go to YouTube and, you know, find gold, uh, you know, gold mine and, and take six as albums. Um, but there's some things that you did and you received producer credit for that a lot of people don't know. Like mm -hmm. before I found out you did something for Martin Lawrence's show that you mm -hmm. get one of the producers credit to mm -hmm. produce that song, the theme song. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that and maybe some things that we don't know. Uh, we've been looking to get into commercials and get into, uh, doing themes, and uh, somebody from, I think, Warner Brothers was like, hey, they're looking for a theme for Martin's uh, show, the the next season of the show. And so Paul Wright, uh, Mark, my brother, and myself, we were like, you know what? Let's come up with something. I think we can, we can do something. So we listened to the theme that they had presently. Mark, who is a consummate arranger, started getting on it, you know, arranging. You know, Paul had the, the technical know-how to get all this stuff together. And we did a theme that we pitched uh, to the uh, Martin uh, producers. And, you know, I guess we were just trying some of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other commercials that we pitched toward as well that, you know, some of them we didn't get. They got a, a Mitsubishi commercial when they had the little dat tapes. That was before I got, just before I got into the group. So they actually landed that one. But they were just trying different ones. For some reason, this one hit. They liked it. Um, <clears throat> that was new for us. We didn't know how to, how to, how to deal with that. But that, that was, we had uh, writing contracts with Warner Chapel. 
And so it helped, even though we really kind of pushed that ourselves, it helped to have Warner Chapel behind us to be able to make the negotiations. And they uh, stepped in and put it in for the next two seasons, I guess, wow. with Martin. Wow. So that was, uh, that was deep to see your name in the credit. And right. Hear your voice, actually. Now, how does that know. work in terms of residuals? Um, I mean, you know, not to get too deep into the music business. No, you but, write you know, something like that. As an attorney, like I think, you know, a lot of attorneys are watching, and we're going to have some of these attorneys mm -hmm. that are going to be on our show to share with some of the music people mm -hmm. who will be watching. How does that work when you get residuals and that type no, of when you write a you write a theme and they pick up that theme, whatever you're negotiating at that time, whenever they play that, for the episode, you get paid for that. You're right. supposed to get paid for that. Right. If that show pretty much ends, but you're actually, you know, it, it's gone into uh, syndication. Syndication. Right. You get paid for that. Wow. When it goes out of the United States and goes into the show is shown in different countries. Wow. You get paid for those airings in those countries, and so your intellectual property is your gold. Wow. And you got to treat right. that with, you have to protect that. Right. Because there are a lot of uh, intellectual vultures out right. there right. that will take your ideas and they'll run with them. Right. Um, the, well, I'm not, uh, well, you know, uh, a report just came out recently of the individual, I'm not sure of his name, who actually sang, uh, I believe he sang the song for Disney's Lion King. Hmm. Um, and Disney apparently had offered him $2 million mm -hmm. to just basically you mm -hmm. know, sing the song. Mm -hmm. For some reason, he said he knew what you're saying about residuals, mm -hmm. and he denied the one-time flat payment of $2 million, which most people are going to take, right? You know, you, right. $2 million? Yeah. And he denied it, and now with his residuals, He's made way more than two million. If they were going to offer you two million, right, to do that, and they're trying to pay you up front, right, they know in their minds that they're going to make over twenty million. Wow, and it's not even just over twenty million. You, that's payment for your kids. Wow, because that continues wow. to pay you. Your work that you do continues to pay you, and people don't realize that they already have in their heads what they need, they already have in their hands what will take care of their family. Right. But if they don't realize that that is your seed right. that you need to plant that's going to feed your family, they will sell that to other people, and other people will take that and profit it. Right. Now, so same in the music industry. Right before we go to, to break, I want you to touch upon um, uh, two things. Okay. No one thing, you know, we were talking a little bit more, uh, you know, um, I want to know who were some of your best influences um, <laughs> coming up um, in, in terms of music. Coming up first, and on the flip side of that question, who are some of the people that you listen to now? <laughs> wow. Uh, well, the Stevie Wonders. Um, now, remember, I came from a religious family. My dad was a pastor, so he wasn't trying to let us listen to any. Uh, secular music, wow. except for what he picked. <laughs> now, he had country western <laughs> stuff that he always used to listen to. Right. But you know, my I used to listen to what my brother and sister listened to: Sister Sledge, uh, uh, Stevie Wonder, uh, some Ray Charles. I also listened because I looked up to my brother. I listened to the vocal stuff he was listening to: Manhattan Transfer and Singers Unlimited. Because that was the cool stuff. Right. You know, they were, their harmonies, the harmonies he liked were based off of big band arrangements. Nice. Done vocally. And so, uh, Singers Unlimited was way ahead of their time. And so, Gene Perling and the, the arrangements he used to do, if you just understood what he did and replicated that, you were considered to be deep. Wow. In, on, on campus and <laughs> they were just trying to write to arrange good music right but that's who mark used to listen to he used right. to listen to groups like uh, um, uh, like quartets right. uh, breath of life quartet 
Right. Um, he'd listen to some of the other quartets, but then Mark would take it and arrange it and make it into something different because he was listening to Singers Unlimited and the high lows. And so those were huge influences for him, so they were huge influences for me. So I started trying to play around. Right. And I'm just trying to be like my big brother. Right, right, I'm right. done thinking that one day people <laughs> will be listening to this stuff. Right, right. But in the process of arranging it, it was training my ear right. to hear this stuff mm -hmm. so that at one point when I get called on later on, I already have the ear you for it because I'm listening. But we used to listen to all those, Daryl Coley, uh, right. Aretha Franklin, um, all those people that, that are icons in their own right. So now, who are some of the people that you're listening to? Man, a lot of these younger people are are amazing. Right now, I, it, Jay Moss. Jay Moss will has taken some of everything he hears and with his team have, have created this. It's like they've taken what we did and now – They've taken the baton, and they're taking it further. They're trying new stuff. They're trying new styles with it. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan, Jonathan McReynolds is something that somebody that I love listening to because he has that transparent uh, speak-to-you type of music, mm -hmm. and he has it with guitar, which is I love listening to that. You know, uh, I still listen to Manhattan Transfer. Uh, Merv Warren did it, their last project, arranged for that, that last project. And I still listen to that kind of stuff. There's so much more. And it could be threatening because you feel like, oh, nobody's going to know about Take Six anymore. But what ends up happening was Take Six took what Singers Unlimited did and made it accessible to our generation. Nice. The next generation is supposed to come and take what you've done mm -hmm. and run the ball further down the line. They need to then create something that you didn't do. Right. That's not a threat to you. Right. That actually is one of the biggest compliments that you've contributed to this big thing called music. Now, they will take your con uh, uh, contribution and they will improve on it. That's what's supposed to happen. It's not supposed to stop with you. Well, before, before your motivation is not supposed to stop with you. That's correct. Somebody else is supposed to take that and take it further down the line. That's all right. So. Right before we go out, um, you know, I really want to get an answer to this question as we go to a break. Uh, so you had Michael and you had Prince. Who would you say is better? You know I can't sit here and say who's <laughs> better, man. Well, you Michael know Jackson, that. They're not around. They're not, they're Here's a story for you. Know? We did, uh, this was the inauguration for Bill Clinton. And I think that Quincy Jones was in charge of the movie. I met him, man. I, I, you I, did. I, I, he's cool. Okay. Okay. Bill is cool. There? Bill is cool. And Friends while we were rehearsing, yeah. it was funny that we were rehearsing with all the artists, uh, Patty Austin. I mean, all these babyface, everybody. And we were all in this tent, different rooms in the tent. And when we went up to do our 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 segment, uh, where we had to learn this big theme song, everybody was doing their part. Yeah. Uh, these two guys kept running on stage. One guy's got the, somebody by the shoulder, and they're running through the stage, and we're just like, what? you know, what is this? What is this about? So they were preparing for the guest secret artist that was going to be there the next day, okay. which turned out to be Michael Jackson. Wow. So, th which was funny, because now as we're walking the next day, day of the inauguration, we're walking through under the bleachers, and they're leading us, and I pass him, and he is standing hidden, supposed to be hidden, <laughs> right here underneath the bleachers where nobody could see him. And I know I saw him. Right. And we went up, and of course, he's the featured guest right. that nobody knew about. Right. And so it's, all I mean, of is us. Is that crazy? Like, yeah. even at that level, they're yeah. hiding Michael Jackson from yeah. the other stars? That, that, has been, that seems to have been most of his life. Wow. So after all this was over, all of the artists were walking together back to the tent. It was, it was kind of a free-for-all. So everybody was just trying to get back to the next event. Right. And so we're all crowded, and I look up, and literally next to me is Michael, and he's walking with me. And I'm sitting here like, first of all, he's taller than I am. I didn't know he was that tall. What? But second of all, I was like, am I going to take the chance? Should I do it? And I was like, this dude... He meets crazy fans all the time. I'm not going to do it. 
and I'm not going to make this dude feel crazy. But literally, I was just, I thought to myself, maybe I should just shake his hand. I copped out then. Okay. But I said, uh, you know. So I say that to say he is, he was uh, huge in his own right. Prince was huge in his own right, man. You, the, you can try to compare the two, but they made two separate contributions. That's what I said. That were incredible. That's why I said stop comparing it. It's like, you know, Tupac and Biggie, right, uh, right, right, LeBron right. James, Michael Jordan. Right, right. Let them make yeah. their contributions on yeah. life. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we're all great, and we all have a room for greatness, and there's always a position for you. If you stay in your lane, there won't be any accidents. We're going to go to break right now.